Well, this is Tanner Dykin once again, pastor at Open Door Baptist Church, uh, just doing another video in this uh, a series of reviews on the uh, debate that I had with uh, Todd Clippert a couple months ago. And uh, now we're starting in on the uh, second night of the debate. The second night was specifically on the relationship between baptism and uh, justification or, or baptism and salvation. And uh, so uh, we're looking at that now. Uh, like I did last time, um, I'm not going to be showing uh, all of the video just, just for the sake of brevity, just so that we can get through this uh, stuff. But uh, again, the, the entirety of the debate is uh, up on my YouTube channel. I think that uh, Todd also has a mirror of the debate uh, on his YouTube channel. And uh, you, uh, I think, the, uh, or, uh, I think the, the channel that he is on is uh, uh, Burleson Baptist or not Baptist, Burleson Church of Christ, uh, or uh, something or another, you, you can likely just type in, uh, you know, uh, Todd Clippard, Tanner Dykin, uh, faith alone debate, or, or faith debate, faith and baptism debate, something like that, and uh, find uh, his stuff uh, there. And uh, so you can go and, and watch the entirety of the uh, debate, uh, you know, on YouTube, and... Uh, so you know tonight we're just uh, we're just looking at uh, Todd's uh, you know material that he presented on the second night, and uh, we won't again be going over all of it. We're uh, starting uh, about nine minutes into the debate, and you can go back and and look at that. Uh, the first nine minutes again were were essentially a, a restatement of the uh, uh, arguments from allegory that he presented on the first night about. Uh, the walls of Jericho about um, about the uh, serpent that was lifted up in the wilderness about uh, and he added two more examples on the second night he added about Naaman the leper and how he went and uh, washed himself in the Jordan and was cleansed from his leprosy and about the man that was uh, that was uh, blind that Jesus healed by uh, spitting in the clay uh, and anointing his eyes with it and telling him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam and uh, he brought those two into it uh, again as as uh, examples to try and show this pattern that he uh, believes the scripture follows of grace law obedience and uh, the reward and uh, again these two analogies don't don't really connect uh, it's it's uh, it's somewhat assumed that uh, these uh, elements that he's imbuing um, meaning onto a map onto the gospel and how saving grace is, uh, you know, acquired. And I'll just say that the even in the gospels, uh, physical healing uh, is not placed on the same level as uh, salvation, as as being redeemed. Uh, we all remember the uh, the event in Jesus' life of the ten lepers that they came uh, wanting to be cleansed by Jesus. Jesus sent them away. He said, go and show yourself to the priests. And uh, as they went, they were all cleansed from their leprosy, but only one of them returned to thank Jesus and give glory to God. And so there we see that even as far as, as physical healing goes, um, physical healing is not the same thing as redemption. And uh, so I think that that's a, a problem in that presentation of, of those uh, examples there. Uh, but here we have, up on the screen, we have some illustra the, the, uh, an illustration uh, or a, 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 par a way that he's parsing out the, the way that, the, that his uh, uh, system here uh, works. Uh, some proof texts that he believes uh, support his pos position of, of the grace of God being given in order so that a law may be uh, obeyed and that by um, doing works of uh, you know uh, faithfulness to God in order to obtain the reward. And uh, not all of these uh, really need to be um, addressed other than to say that um, that the you know the law is not of faith, that faith is not, a law in the New Testament. It's, it's never considered a law in the New Testament. Um, that that some of these items that he views as being separate from faith are, are in fact not separate. 
uh, that repentance is just an aspect of faith, turning from self-sufficiency in order to trust on Christ. Uh, you know, confession uh, of Christ before the world as, uh, you know, as being an, an outpouring of faith, that, that, it, that, it, that it, uh, it follows after faith, which, which faith justifies. It is not the, the confession of Christ before the world that justifies. Um, and, uh, you know, so these things don't really need to be uh, so much addressed. They weren't so much about uh, the topic of the debate, uh, but I will address uh, a few of these. He has up on the screen Titus uh, chapter 2 and verse 11, uh, and the passage says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And uh, the way that he was using this is, is not in an objection. It's not in an, obje in, in an objectionable way so much other than um, that he, he would view this grace as being uh, preparatory uh, to obedience to a law. Um, but the, the idea, of course, that the grace of God has, has been made manifest to, to the world and is being made manifest to the world by the preaching of the gospel is, is not objectionable. You know, that, that's just, uh, you know, basic uh, understanding that, that God sends the gospel out to the world. Uh, that Christ is being made known, the grace of God, Jesus Christ is being made to the world. Uh, and even the idea that this may be some kind of uh, a prevenient activity, that, that, that the gospel is being sent out as uh, preparatory um, to the calling of God on individuals, to call them to faith in Jesus Christ, the inward call of regeneration. And, uh, you know, that this isn't, a, you know, this isn't something that we would, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, wouldn't disagree about. But I will say that uh, in the, the passage, the, the reason that this is being brought up, that the grace of God has appeared, uh, is to spur believers to living holy lives. Uh, the context is in commandments given to believing slaves, slaves that believe on Jesus Christ, and how they ought to serve their masters well in all fidelity. And, uh, that the grace of God appearing even to their master, who they may somewhat dislike because they're, you know, their master, he's their master. Um, he, he has a legal, you know, uh, he has a, maybe a document that says that he owns them. And so they, they may dislike him. But nonetheless, because the gospel is known to them, they ought to live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world looking for the hope of Jesus Christ because their, their master knows this and they want to be a good witness before their master. And so I just thought I'd, I'd make a note about that here. Uh, he has uh, Mark 16 up there. We'll look at that here in just a minute. He goes into a little uh, more depth on that here in, in just a little bit. Um, he has uh, 1 John 1, 7 and Matthew 10, 22. And I want to look at those. Uh, 1 John 1, and uh, verse 7 uh, says, uh, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from sin. And he, uh, he takes this to be a requirement, right? That we must walk in the light, otherwise Jesus Christ will not cleanse us from sin, would be kind of a negative statement of that passage. Um, I would say that this is just descriptive language, that if we are Christ's, right, if we belong to him, then we will walk in the light. And, and by walking in the light, we make ourselves known to be his. And having fellowship one with another, having the, the, the substance of, of regeneration being his, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from sin. He doesn't cleanse us from sin because we walk in the light. If that were the case, no one would be saved. Uh, you know, we, we, we were all children of disobedience. We, you know, we looked at uh, depravity before. Um, if, if it were up to me being able to walk in the light, then I would never be saved because I, I would never come to the light because I hated the light. Uh, and so... Uh, if, if it were up to me coming to the light in order to be 
cleansed then and, and, and continuing to walk in the light, then, uh, it would, you know, it, it wouldn't work out. Um, and so, you know, here we, we see some descriptive language being used that if we are the kind of people that walk in the light, that means we are also the people who Christ cleanses from sin and, uh, no, no difficulty here uh, for us. Uh, he also looked at Matthew 10, uh, verse 22, uh, Matthew 10, 22, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Uh, a good passage. I love this passage, uh, because it's, it's a statement of perseverance, actually, uh, that if we are Christ's, right? If we are Christ's, we shall be hated of all men for his namesake, but also he that endureth to the end shall be saved. The question is, is this a requirement on us that we have to be able of ourselves to, uh, to endure to the end? Or is this a statement of description? What happens to a believer? What happens over the course of a believer's life? And uh, I would say that that's what it is, that it's a description, that if we endure to the end, we are showing ourselves by, by this sort of broad, uh, you know, um, uh, proof of our life, we are showing ourselves to the world by enduring even through trials and tribulations, uh, that we are saved, that we are his. Uh, we looked at John 8 uh, in the first I believe it was the very first video of this review series and uh, how in that passage, uh, you know, Jesus uh, says, um, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And what he was saying there is that if free future tense, you continue in my word, if future tense, you endure to the end, then presently, you are my disciples. Presently, you, 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 you are mine. And I would say that that's what's, what's being gotten at here, is that, that if we continue to the end, if we endure to the end, and thus are finally, ultimately saved, then it's just a proof that all along we had genuine faith in Jesus Christ, that, that we had been made new by him, and that he had been the one to save us. And, uh, and so again, there's there's no difficulty uh, here for uh, you know the the the, the understanding uh, you know believer that 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 we we understand what Jesus is saying here. This is something that believers do because we've been made new in Him. Uh, he also goes to Matthew seven twenty one, and I'm not sure if I. Um, if I addressed this in the debate or not, I may have, but I'll go ahead and address it again here. Uh, he says, you know, the, the, the scripture says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my father, which is in heaven. Uh, again, is this descriptive of believers or is this a requirement that has to be fulfilled in order to have the saving grace of God on us? And I would say contextually that that is descriptive. It describes what a believer is. Um, if we look back up in verse 15, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. The context shows us that, that the doing the will of the Father in heaven is a fruit, but that that fruit is not a requirement in order to, to become a good tree. That that fruit is a result of being a good tree, 
that is being made new by Jesus Christ, being born again of him. If we've been born again, if we have salvation in, in, in the initial conversion sense of that, uh, we have been converted to Christ, then we are made a good tree and we bring forth good fruit. And that is, we do the will of our Father in heaven. It's descriptive of what we, uh, as believers, do. And uh, so, uh, just a, a, a quick explanation of that. Now, finally, the, the last one that I want to look at uh, for the moment, and again, we'll get into uh, some of these others later, uh, is Hebrews 5 and verse 9. Hebrews 5, 9. Um, this is a... Uh, uh, a passage where it, it does us well to, to understand the argument of Hebrews. Uh, the passage says, And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And, and again, the, um, the question is, um, you know, it, is this saying that it is necessary to obey in this in this context is it necessary to obey as a a precondition in order to receive salvation from him and again i'm going to i'm going to show that the passage is not saying that but rather it's saying that because of what christ has done therefore all those who are converted to him will obey him and it's, it's not a product of their obeying him that they are then converted to him. Uh, if we look back in verse, um, we'll just look in verse 7. Speaking of, uh, of Jesus, uh, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. In the passage, the, the, the primary um, focus, of course, is, is Jesus Christ's obedience. What did Jesus do? That Jesus, when he had suffered, when he was, when he was uh, dying on the, sin, uh, on the cross for our sins, he was in perfect obedience. He learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And because of his obedience, he became the author of salvation. That is, he is the one that does salvation. Uh, just like, uh, you know, somebody writes a book, they're the author of that book. Uh, maybe somebody writes a guest list or, or somebody um, you know, checks off a guest list or, or, or whatever. Um, he is the author of eternal salvation, right? He is the one that produces it. And his obedience here is primary. It comes first. He obeys and so becomes the author of salvation. And the question is, do we take obedience in this context to be a cooperative effort with him because that seems to me the only way that you could take it if you do not take our obedience as a product of his obedience uh, the way that i take this passage and i think the way we should is that because jesus christ obeyed and he saved that therefore all those who he saves obey after him uh, they do not obey in order to be saved because that requirement was fulfilled by him he obeyed uh, and uh, you know so what happens is he obeys first by his obedience and suffering he saves us and then because of that we then obey and uh, the only other way that i could think that you would take this um or i i think you would have to take this if you don't take it that way is to say that Jesus obeyed and he did everything he could, but we still have to, to, to fill up the lack of his obedience. That in some way his obedience was deficient here and our obedience has to supply what he, uh, what he did, was not able to supply. And uh, I think that that's, 
that's just missing the entire argument of Hebrews, uh, that Jesus Christ and, and everything that he does is perfect and better than anything else. And so uh, Hebrews 5 verse 9, uh, I don't think shows us that uh, we, we uh, have to obey as a requirement for uh, receiving salvation. And so that's the that's this uh, chart that he brought up of, of passages that he went through. And uh, with that, we'll just uh, skip down here a little bit and look at some more of the things that he uh, brought up in that uh, first rebuttal or that first, uh, um, yeah, that first uh, section. Let's take a look for a moment at uh, Mark chapter 16. I've mentioned this passage a couple of times already. In Mark 16 and verse 16, we have here on slide 210 a, a, a diagram of this sentence, which helps us to understand the construction of the sentence and its ultimate meaning. And so as we, as we look at, at this, we see that there are two different independent clauses here, and we're going to focus on the one on top, that he will be saved who believes and is baptized. Slide 211, please, Ben. Again, this verse is composed of two independent clauses, and the construction of the second clause in no way negates the force of the first. Many people, in trying to, to quibble over the force of what Jesus said in the first part of Mark 16, 16, say that, well, he didn't mention anything about baptism in the second half, so really faith is the only important thing. And that's simply nothing more than the figment of somebody's imagination. Who did Jesus say would be saved? He who believes and is baptized. Slide 212, if you would please, Ben. Again, who believes and is baptized is an adjective clause modifying the one who will be saved. Moreover, you see on, or you, as you did see in the diagram, and is a coordinating conjunction making belief in the gospel and baptism of equal import among those who would be saved. Now, Ben, if you would please bring me slide three. All right, so uh, there is uh, his um, presentation of Mark 16, verse 16. Uh, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And uh, he brings up a few, um, you know, points, uh, you know, uh, about that. And uh, there's, uh, he, he, he brings it up and, and, and he, he tries to parse out the verse itself and, and say, well, he that believeth and is baptized, that you, you have to have that, that baptized to, you know, in order to, for, for it to, to mean anything, that, that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. If, and, 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 you know, by his extended logic here, if, if, if a person is not baptized, they shall not be saved. And uh, I think that anyone can see that that's not necessarily the case. You know, first off, just by uh, the way that language works. Uh, language is, is not always something that you can just rigorously uh, cut into little pieces and, and diagram it out. And, uh, and, and find out the meaning by strict rules. It's a lot more fluid. It's, it's, it's a lot more flexible than that. Uh, and there are ways of using this kind of construction that are uh, reasonable, that, that, that makes sense, that work. Um, just in English, uh, you know, he that believeth and says his prayers shall be saved. You know, he that believeth and uh, brushes his teeth, as some have said, shall be saved. You know, uh, he that believeth and does evangelism shall be saved. All of these uh, are true statements, right? All of these are true statements under, uh, you know, the, the uh, doctrine of faith alone, right? Uh, as long as faith is in there, then there's nothing wrong with saying that he that has faith, he that believeth, and uh, uh, you know does some uh, expected thing, right? Like being baptized, or saying your prayers, or going and evangelizing, or or eating 
uh, your meals or whatever, uh, that they will be saved, right? And so, you know, that this, you know, this kind of rigor, you know, like trying to, to, to pin this down as it, 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 it must be this way. And, and it, it and, and grammatically it couldn't be taken in any other way is is just a you know a little bit over the top I, I think and uh, you know so there's that um, he, he just glosses over and and states that you know the second half doesn't you know uh, mean anything and uh, you know he that that he that believeth not shall be damned that baptism is not mentioned there um, he doesn't find that uh, at all compelling, and it's it's not so much compelling, it, it, but it is a marker that tells us, well, we might look into this a little more. It, it would have been very easy for Jesus to say, you know, he that believeth not, nor is baptized, shall be damned. You know, it would have been easy for him to say that, but he did not say that. And uh, so uh, it, it's just a marker to look a little bit closer. Um, and for some, this is sufficient and that's, that's perfectly fine. I think that there's a contextual argument though, to be made that this is not the intention of Jesus's statement here. Uh, that Jesus is not telling them about the mechanics of salvation, but he's giving them signs by which they will know the genuineness of converts. The verse before in verse 15, he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So Jesus is sending them out on mission. He's telling them to go and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, and as sending them out, he also gives them some practical advice, some practical um, tells to look for as they go. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth not shall be damned. If a person confesses belief in Christ and is baptized, they are to be considered as saved. They are to be to be incorporated into the number of the, uh, the congregation. Uh, but if they will not even confess belief, well, they are condemned. They, they will not be saved. Uh, he also gives them some signs to do not just with individuals but corporately and 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 to to look for these signs as a symbol that salvation has come uh, to the nations uh, in verse 17 and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name shall they cast out devils they shall speak with new tongues they shall take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt them they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover these symbols uh, that were for the first century for the establishment of the church. Uh, he gives uh, these as, as corporate signs. This is the sign that, uh, the, that God's spirit is going out, that the gospel is going to the nations. Uh, we would take this and, and we would go elsewhere in the scripture and see that the spirit works according to his own will. To some, he gives these gifts as in the first century. To uh, others, he gives other gifts as Today, he gives, you know, uh, not just, uh, you know, to the casting out of devils and speaking of new tongues and taking up ser serpents, but he also gives the gifts of teaching. He gives the gifts of uh, evangelism. He gives the gifts of mercies and helps and such. Um, and uh, so these, these gifts here are signs corporately of uh, salvation coming and individually when you see somebody confessing belief and being baptized, they are, are to be considered as saved. You, you have uh, a, uh, you know, a sign, this sign given to you that they uh, are to be considered saved. Um, and that's all I think is happening here. He's not giving us a, uh, a sort of uh, look at the mechanics of how salvation uh, works, but rather he is sh uh, showing us signs by which we shall know if somebody has genuinely been converted to Christ. And uh, so that's uh, Mark 16, verse 16. Um, and uh, then uh, he goes to Acts 2, 38. And let's just listen to uh, some of what he has to say about that. Slide number 320. 
want to briefly examine Acts 2 and verse 38, where Peter, in preaching what is commonly referred to as the first gospel sermon on the day of Pentecost, as he preached about the resurrected Christ, those that heard what he said, said when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so we find in this verse, there are two phrases I want us to consider with regard to Acts 2 and verse 38. First is, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. What is meant, and Ben, if you can bring up slide 320, if we have difficulty, it's all right, I can walk through it. What is meant by the phrase, in the name of? And the phrase, in the name of, means by the authority of. Uh, we can recall uh, for example, at least in, I'm old enough to remember my childhood where uh, the, the police would jump out and tell the, tell the bad guy, stop in the name of the law. In other words, I have the authority of the law to command you to stop. And so to do things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ means to do things by his authority. So what kind of, what kind of baptism did Jesus authorize? Well, in Matthew 28, and verse 19, again, Ben, if, if slide 321 comes up, that's fine. If not, in Matthew 28 and verse 19, the, ba the baptism that Jesus authorized is one that makes a person a disciple. Go and make disciples of all the nations. How do you do that? By baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In Mark 16, 16, the baptism that Jesus authorized is a baptism that brings salvation. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And then in Luke 24 and verse 47, we see where Jesus said that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And Peter preached that exact same thing in Acts 2 and verse 38 when he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. All right, so uh, Acts 2.38, uh, he just quoted, uh, I believe, you know, or repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Um, you know, a, a passage that's been fought over for uh, so long, it, it, it is brought up in every single discussion on this issue. Um, but uh, I brought up in the debate, and uh, later in the debate, he he tried to... to uh, dismiss this objection by um, by trying to claim that it, 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 it was in some sense not an objection or something like that. But um, in Acts 2.38, uh, uh, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Uh, saying it like that, some may believe that that sounds a lot like baptism is for the remission of sins, that, that, that baptism is the way that we get at the remission of sins. Uh, but that little word for there that's, that's translated uh, in the Greek, the word is, uh, can have a different use uh, than uh, is, is being implied here. Uh, it can have the use because of this, because of uh, something else. And um, the, the example that I provided uh, in the debate was Luke eleven thirty two, 32. The men of Nineveh shall rise up uh, in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at, is, you know, that's the word at, for they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Uh, so the men of Nineveh, they repented at or because of, because Jonah had preached to them. So the, the preaching of Jonah came first, and then because of, of the preaching of Jonah, they repented. And, and grammatically, it's a parallel to uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Uh, you know, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, is the forgiveness of your sins. And the question is whether that is is used as because of 
the remission of your sins, as I would say it's being used, or in order to obtain the remission of sins. And uh, that is, is in, a, in a sense, the question. The, the point is that the passage can go either way, that there is warrant in the language to take it the way that we understand it to be, that this is that they are commanded that when they receive the remission of their sins or because they have received the remission of their sins, they are commanded to be baptized. And I think that that fits perfectly well, uh, that that is, is warranted by uh, the theology of the book of Acts, that sometimes the Holy Spirit comes before baptism, sometimes it comes after baptism, sometimes it comes at baptism, uh, that it is it is not con it is it is not a uh, reliable predictor of the Holy Ghost and when he will come uh, that that the time of baptism is not a reliable predictor of that in the book of Acts um, and so uh, I think that, that it's it's better to take this take the remission of the, of, our, of their sins and the gift of the Holy Ghost uh, to uh, be the occasion of being baptized rather than the other way around. And uh, that uh, that fits in the context very well. Um, he mentioned Matthew 28, 19 uh, also. And uh, I don't think that this, that, that what he said about it really makes much a difference to the debate um, uh, that, you know, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, even if you take that the um, that baptism is what makes a person a disciple, uh, that doesn't mean that they're thereby justified by baptism. And that's that's that was kind of the point of the debate. Um, Though I'm not sure that even grammatically you can make that kind of claim in that text. It, 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 he just says, go make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If anything, it seems to be the other way around. That they're made a disciple and therefore they are baptized. Um, let's look at Acts 22.16 uh, and what he said about that next. In Acts 22 and verse 16, as Paul recounted his own conversion with regard to his incident or his encounter with Ananias, as Ananias spoke to him, he said to Saul, that, that time known as Saul of Tarsus, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And so that passage is extremely clear that to be baptized is to wash away one's sins and calling on the name of the Lord is a phrase that describes that act, much like baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in Matthew 28, 19, describes how the disciple is made. And All right. So uh, Acts 22, 16. Uh, Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. I mentioned in uh, my debate with Matt McDougall, and I might have mentioned it here in this debate, I'm not sure. Um, the, uh, the 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 way that this verse is put together um, lends itself actually more not to baptism being the occasion of washing away of sins, but rather calling on the name of the Lord as as the, the primary association here. Uh, again. Um, it as so long as Paul is calling on the name of the Lord when he is baptized, uh, it it doesn't it doesn't hurt me to say that he received the uh, the washing away of his sins at the time of his baptism. Uh, but in the passage, we, we still see that it's more closely associated with calling on the name of the Lord, and that's because there are only two uh, occasions of in in the Greek of the the word and. In this verse uh, we have to kind of slip one in there in order for the grammar to to work very well in uh, English uh, but the only two occasions of the word and the word K in in uh, this verse are at the very beginning 
of the verse and right between being baptized and washing away of sins. Uh, it, it kind of it kind of puts a uh, right there uh, in in the middle of the verse a separation between washing away of sins and being baptized that arising up be baptized right that is one idea you know rise and be baptized that's one thing the physical you know motion of, of doing that and wash away thy sins calling on the name of the lord that is the inner thing that's happening so the physical arise and be baptized the spiritual wash away thy sins calling on the name of the lord and the, the implication here is that the calling on the name of the Lord is the thing by which he washes away his sins. Now, of course, baptism is a symbol of washing away of sins. And so I have nothing wrong with saying that ba baptism here is associated with washing away of sins. But uh, it is not the thing which affect, uh, uh, affects the remission of sins, the washing away of sins in the verse. And... Uh, so with that, we'll just look at one final uh, passage. Uh, I'll just uh, go ahead and, and uh, uh, we'll just hear what he says once again on it. And then finally, we have Romans chapter 6 and verses 3 through 6 and, verse, uh, and verse also verses 17 and 18 as we prepare to close. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we also should walk in newness of life. So we walk in newness of life after we have been buried and raised with Christ. In verse 5, it says, For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. And so we see again the condition of baptism. If we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. And this accords with what we noted last night from verses 17 and 18. But God be thanked that when you were the servants of sin, you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. All right. Uh, just this final uh statement he made uh, on his opening statement um we'll uh we'll just go ahead and, and look at the passage uh, i already looked at verse 17 in romans 6 uh fairly extensively and so we won't we won't touch that uh anymore in these um but i will just just note again in, at the beginning of chapter 6 that this is a typological language this is imagistic language uh, that these are pictures which which show a reality the reality is not the pictures but the pictures show what the reality is uh, he read it himself as he went if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection it's likeness language it's, it's a picture of it we have in a picture been like his death and we also should be in the likeness of his resurrection uh the, you know the picture of we should we should look like his resurrection um this this is not showing us how we are born again uh or you know this is not saying that that we have to undergo the physical rite of baptism to be born again uh, but rather it is it is showing us a reality that if we have been born again we should walk in newness of life we should walk as jesus walked uh, and i think that more deeply uh, that if we have the substance of this symbol again this is a likeness it, it uses very obviously imaging language um, but if we have the substance of it, if we've been born again, then we will walk in newness of life. We will be in the likeness of his resurrection. Not because we were baptized. Not because 
of uh, not not for our own sakes, something that we did. Uh, and so we got this to ourselves. But because he has come in, he has changed our lives. He has brought us to the substance of the new life by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on us, by, by giving us a new heart. And so we will walk in newness of life. And this appeal uh, to believers is using their baptism as an image and as a, a pledge that, that Paul is, is grabbing onto. And he's saying, you have been baptized. You have shown this forth. Now you need to live out the reality that it symbolizes. And uh, so, uh, again, uh, it does not say that this is the substance of salvation, but it does say that it is a likeness of salvation. It's a picture of salvation. And uh, so, uh, in this passage, again, I, I don't see baptismal regeneration. And uh, so that is uh, it with uh, Todd's opening statement on the second night. Uh, I'll do uh, another one of these videos on the uh, rebuttal portions, and uh, they get a, a lot more involved than uh, what we've seen in these uh, opening statements. And uh, so there's going to be a lot of material, I believe, that we're going to need to go through on those. Uh, but I'll see what we uh, need to go through, and I'll make another one of these, and uh, you can watch that and uh, hopefully gain something from it. And so until then, uh, God bless.